Hello, my friend. How are you? We had an exclusive interview with David Morrell, the author of the Rambo series. For the anniversary of the premiere of the Rambo 3, we present to yours this exclusive interview conducted by my friend Matt Thomas Marchand. Happy watching to everyone. Peace and love from Badamax Video. Hello. Hello. Good morning. Switch. Yeah. See if we can enable the video. Okay, there we are. All right. Uh, can you see me? I I can. I got my. I can see. Okay. I'm just waiting. Uh, I can't. I can't see you on your side. Uh. Oh, well, I accept the video. Just a minute here. Um. All right, let's try this. Oh, there we are. There we go. Hey, hi. How's it going? Well, it's all right, thank you. So, uh, you want to talk about Rambo First Blood Part Two? Is that right? I can't remember what we're talking about. I want to talk about everything, anything and everything. Um, Rambo First Blood Part Two. Yeah, I, I just, I just read the, read through the rest of it. The other night, and and fantastic. And did you have the edition that had the introduction? Oh uh, yeah, when you talked about the um, uh, receiving like the video in the mail. Yes. Yeah. Very 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 cool. I got it for the um, for the Kindle. I got it back in. Um, I'm guessing it was October. I picked it up for the Kindle. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had heard you on another interview with uh, Books and Nachos. Uh, could be. I, you know, I do, I do several interviews, you know, uh, maybe one or two a month. So it could be. I, sometimes I can't remember them all. Cool, cool. It's all right. Um, I just want to apologize in advance. My modem is broken, so if, if the connection breaks... Um, I'm gonna ring you right back. We've okay. been we've been having a no problem. So um, so what are we? What is this interview for? And how are we going? Oh, um, hold on, you cut out for a second. Um, I just had um some fan questions, and um some some questions, some uh, general questions, and uh, I wanted to talk about the book and. And maybe some of your experiences and things like that. Right, but what I don't understand is how you're going to use it. Oh, oh, <clears throat> um, I was just going to make it like a like a discussion video. Uh huh. Like so a. So in other words, you're recording this. Uh yeah, yeah. Okay, I didn't. I wasn't clear that we were just talking, or as if you were recording. Oh, this. okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't, I don't, I don't. Um, think I'll have the video part, I think it will just be like, um, audio, like the audio part. Okay. All right. I'm just making sure the, okay, that's good. <clears throat> so yeah, this is, uh, this is like a, a really big honor. You know, I, I've been a Rambo fan pretty much all my, all, almost all my life since I guess maybe five or six years old. Uh -huh. And wow. Like, I remember um, when I was younger, in, in, in around 2000, when I saw the, um, I picked up the uh, the metal box, the the trilogy yes, back in the metal box, yeah. and uh, I saw those those great documentaries on there, and then I was like, I gotta get this book, so I went out and got the book right away, and you know, over, over the course of reading it for like two days, I was just. So no, when, you're, when you mean the book, you mean First Blood? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was just yeah, so I remember drawn that in. Box, that tin box set. I think I wrote the liner notes for it. Cool. Yeah, unfortunately, I I lost my box. Someone borrowed it, and they never brought it back. And so when it was out of print for a very long time, the the distributor changed, and so I was disappointed because I had done a full length audio commentary for the film First Blood, mm -hmm. talking about the novel, my novel, and, and, and the way it was adapted. And uh, so for about, oh, five years, uh, the 
audio commentary and the um, Drawing First Bullet documentary was not available. Mm -hmm. And then after it switched over to another distributor, I guess some negotiations took place because now, at least on the Blu-ray version, that documentary and my audio commentary are now available. Yeah, I I I I can't wait to. I don't have a a Blu-ray a Blu-ray presently, but I can't wait to. Well, here's the here's the thing. If anybody's buying a um, DVD player, mm -hmm. the Blu-ray Blu-ray players used to be very expensive. They're now as cheap as a DVD player. They're very cheap. And they will play ordinary DVDs. Oh. In addition to playing Blu-ray DVDs. Uh, however, if you have an ordinary DVD player, it will not play a Blu-ray. So it only makes sense to buy the Blu-ray, which will play everything, and which will take the DVD and double the lines on it, so the DVDs look better on a Blu-ray. So it's a no-brainer to buy a Blu-ray player. Wow. I guess we're getting a Blu-ray. <laughs> but they're not expensive. They're, mm -hmm. what, $65? I mean, that, of course, is relative what's expensive, mm -hmm. but, you know, they used to be $500. Yeah, yeah, I remember they were very, very expensive when, um, when they first came out. Yeah. Um... And like, like later on down the road, I bought the the green box when it came out in uh, two, late two thousand eight, maybe two thousand nine, early two thousand nine. And um, I, I noticed that a lot of the stuff from the metal box wasn't in that box set. Yes, that, that's right. That was a distribution problem. And but finally, the new distributor uh, distributor bought the material from the old the previous one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. But it, it's cool that now on the on the Blu-ray edition, you know, we get to see like the uh, the commentary and, and everything else. I I know on on the other box set, I think the uh, there was only the Stallone commentary on the green box. That's side. right, and on the new one, they have both size and mine. Cool, very cool. And uh, in addition, it it it's not much. They have the footage from. The original ending to the movie where Rambo dies, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it's what a minute less than that, thirty seconds. It's it's more stop action than anything, but it gives somebody an idea of how the film might otherwise. This we're talking about first blood now might otherwise have ended. Yeah, a very uh, controversial ending, also from from what I heard from the well, documentary. It, it wasn't. It was. I don't know how we would define controversial. The, um, the, in the novel, in my book, Rambo Dies, mm -hmm. uh, they filmed an ending in which he dies. They showed a film with that ending to a test audience in Las Vegas, Nevada, and the audience was very upset mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, in part because Rocky had been released and they were sort of identifying with Sylvester. Um, in that fashion, and the audience in the remarks, heated remarks, I gather, uh, said they wanted the ending change. And the producers flew back to British Columbia and shot a new ending. And the significance here is that no one in the production had planned for a sequel. Their plan was to release a film in which Rambo died. Mm -hmm. So with this audience reaction and them going back to shoot a, uh, a scene in which he lived, now they said, well, what do you know? Um, and the film was so popular, so extremely popular. They said, all right, let's, uh, let's make the sequels. So it was a kind of a, a chain of accident that led to the sequels. Oh, wow. And the... the the sequels too are like, or it's like, me personally, First Blood's my favorite. It's the first one I saw. It's it's um, the one I feel that's um, the most able for like, say like a person to be able to um, to be able to overcome some of the feats that happen in that movie. Yeah, it's, it's very less human. It's yeah, realistic. yes. People, it was filmed in such a way 
Of course, it's distinct, distinguished by uh, real stunts. Mm -hmm. This is before computer-generated images, so that it is what a human being could conceivably do, by definition, since we, real people are doing it. And uh, that lends an element of realism to the movie that um, current action films, for the most part, don't have. Mm -hmm. When 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 you saw the when you got the uh, the footage for the sequel when they were asking you to do the novel novelization uh, yes did you think it was going to be did you did you think it would look like that did you think it would have that kind of over the top kind of uh, like grandiose kind of feel to it I knew it would look good I knew it would look big I mean the footage they showed me was. Uh was uh, Rambo in the helicopter coming back to uh, rescue the POWs. And with Jerry Goldsmith's music and with those wonderful explosive effects, uh, I, I just remember watching the footage and saying this is going to be a big movie. Um, so yeah, I, I, I hadn't at that time read the script, but I knew that um, the, the production company, Carolco, no longer in existence, um, that they were aiming for a very big action film. Cool. And they hired good people. They were not cheap. Mm -hmm. um, their cinematographer is Jack Cardiff, a, a many times Oscar-nominated uh, cinematographer who also uh, was famous for being uh, the cinematographer for a, 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 a group of very distinguished British films directed by the team of Powell and Pressburger. Uh, and he was known for his use of color. Mm -hmm. So that, that movie is absolutely brilliant looking in yes. terms of its cinematographer. In addition, it is one of the last films to use true Technicolor equipment before it Technicolor finally went kaput, and the equipment was all sold to uh, firms in China. So I think uh, Rambo First Blood Part Two and Godfather Three. I'd have to check on which Godfather might be Godfather Two. Um, that those are two of the last well-known films that were filmed in the true using true uh, Technicolor equipment. Wow! Wow, that's cool. And like I, yeah, like when you look at the picture, it's just it's great. Even I, I found like um, the cinematography, even for like Rambo Three, it was really like super wide. It was like well, there, super the, nice. The wide, now, now you're talking about a Panavision, which is a aspect ratio of mm -hmm. two, three, five to one. Uh, so that's what makes it look wide. But even in a wide aspect ratio, films can look cheap and small, but these guys, the directors and their cinematographer, because uh, they work hand in hand, were, uh, uh, you know, filling the screen, which isn't always the case in a true widescreen film. Yeah, it, 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 looks, it, looks, it looks great though, and, and the novelization for Rambo 3 is just, wow. Well, I, I started reading that and I was just like, I was blown away because in my mind, they would have had such a great film if they would have mixed all those elements together. The, the screenplay, as I say in my introduction to Rambo First Blood Part Two, the novelization, the screenplay was very thin. Mm -hmm. It was perhaps 80 pages. The average length of the screenplay is 115. Um, the, 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 Stage directions were very minimal. I remember one page that said Rambo jumps up and shoots this guy, Rambo jumps up and shoots that guy. Uh, so I was disheartened, as, as you know from the introduction. Mm -hmm. the, uh, at that time, novelizations were a key marketing element for films. So the production company really, really, really wanted a novelization. And I am the only person by contract, who can write prose, write fiction about Rambo. So they, they needed me, and uh, when I looked at the script, I said, I don't know what I can do with this. 
this. This is not, this is, is pretty thin. Yeah. Uh, now on the screen, it's a different matter where you have performers and you have the special effects of the explosions and you have Sylvester looking so wonderful and, uh, you know, you have helicopters and there's a lot of stuff for the eyes. But if you look at it simply as a document, it's very thin. So I said, I don't know what else, have you got anything else? What else do you have? And they said, well, we have this script by James Cameron that we didn't use. And I said, you mean James Cameron as in the Terminator? And they said, yes. And now this is before Terminator 2. This is before Aliens. This is James Cameron in his early period. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I think I better look at the screenplay. And the idea, it was clear why they didn't use it, because Rambo had a sidekick in it. Um, and the only person I felt who could have been the sidekick was John Travolta, whom Sylvester had just directed in Staying Alive, the sequel to Saturday yeah. Night Fever. And they had gotten along well, I gather. Uh, and it seemed as if, hey, they'll work together, and this time Travolta will be the comic kid on the mission of Rambo. Well, that wasn't going to fly. And uh, the, there were also some early scenes in which Rambo was in a mental institution in the basement in a locked cell with a uh, armed guard outside uh, 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 saying he thinks he's, the uh, armed guard says of Rambo, he thinks he's the Prince of Darkness. And uh, the producers were very afraid of making Rambo seem um, not in his right mind. Mm -hmm. uh, so they didn't want the Insane Asylum sequence. And there were a lot of other scenes that were really, really cool, just wonderful scenes that they didn't use. Mm -hmm. uh, so I said to the producers, remembering that they absolutely needed this for their marketing, I said I would do the novelization if I had the right to uh, expand the story. In the normal novelization, uh, a, a writer is hired, he's paid very little, mm -hmm. and he or she um, is told simply to take the, the, the screenplay, uh, use the dialogue as written, and uh, expand the, uh, it into a book by uh, describing a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said I wasn't prepared to do that, uh, but that I would, if they were willing, this is what I would do. There would be one third the actual shooting script, so they'd recognize the movie. There'd be one third James Cameron with all that extra stuff that they didn't use. And there'd be one third me making this the Rambo that I would recognize. So it was an extremely unusual, perhaps the most unique novelization ever written. And it and it really it really got the followers. It was six weeks on the New York Times bestseller list, which with a few exceptions never happens. Never happened that novelizations aren't really current anymore. Uh, so it was very interesting to do the novelization as an experiment. Uh, mm -hmm. and knowing that I was breaking new ground and doing stuff that was very, very different. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, it, was, uh, it was fun to write. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, it must be after 13 years being able to go back to the character. Well, it was more than 13 years. Uh, the movie came out in 1985. Oh, so it's this, true. Yeah. This is now approaching, what, the 30th anniversary? Yeah. Uh, next year will be the 30th anniversary. So it's been more than 13 no, but years. I, I mean, at, at the time, at the time of writing it, being uh, able to well, I see what you're saying. Yes, uh, but, well, actually, the novel First Blood came out in 1972, yeah. and the film came out in 1982. And of course, that was a heroic thing in itself. There were 26 scripts and five studios involved. And at one time, Steve McQueen was Rambo with uh, Sidney Pollock, uh, one of my favorite directors, uh, uh, as director. Um, but Steve McQueen was 45 years old mm -hmm. when they were going to make that in the mid-70s and it, it, it simply wouldn't work because there were no young, there were no 45-year-old Vietnam veterans mm -hmm. in 1975. It was a young person's war, unlike 
Iraq and Afghanistan, and from the American point of view, where the average uh, military personnel was maybe 45 years old. So everything got turned around. Anyhow, it was, you know, so the movie came out 10 years after the novel, and then they knew they could do the sequel, so three years later the sequel came out. That's amazing. That's amazing. And then, boom, you know, like Rambo Man just took off, like, well, the, the, the first movie had been very, very popular, First mm -hmm. Blood. Uh, some people call it Rambo, and I, I can understand that, but that's not the title. That's the title of the fourth film. The first movie is called First Blood. Um, and it did very well. It did extremely well. Uh, Rambo First Blood Part Two was off the charts. It was an extraordinary. That summer was, in 1985, was just absolutely extraordinary. It was easily the summer of Rambo. He was everywhere. And the novelization was um, summarized in uh, newspapers, even. Um, the attention that, that the character got was uh, overwhelming. Yeah, yeah, it's like I, I've been doing so much research uh, to do this podcast. Like in the beginning, it kind of it kind of was like a, like a personal blog. And then, you know, like I started discovering all these other people who had Rambo art and, and, and stuff like that and try to, you know, create a place where we could kind of like just hang out and show everybody's Rambo stuff. Right. And while wow, like doing the research, uh, I, I thought it, in the beginning, um, I thought I could do it in 12 episodes and I quickly realized it would take like hundreds. Well, <laughs> You might want to cut back on that. But. <laughs> yeah, there's just so much. Uh, there's just so much great, great stuff out there, and and like even like the season. Uh, like right now, we're in season two. We're talking about the second movie, and I've had to kind of like stretch it out three times now, just because there's there was so much going on in that era. Like when you get to Reagan, and when you get well, to this, Ronald, and when you get to that. Ronald Reagan, as we know. Um, adopted Rambo uh, in, in the sense that he referred to the character frequently mm -hmm. in press conferences and speeches, um, sometimes uh, making me nervous. Uh, in, in, a, in a famous press conference, he said, I saw a Rambo movie last night. Now I know what to do the next time there's a terrorist hostage crisis. Mm -hmm. And uh, it may be he was joking, it was hard to tell, uh, but some people took him seriously and thought that he was advocating, oh, what the hell, let's just go in and, and you know, yeah. just blow everything up. Uh, and in fact, I was in England uh, in, I can't say the date for sure, it was in the 1980s when um, the United States bombed um, Darn, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank on the country where um, Gaddafi, Libya, Libya. And uh, I was in on a publicity tour in England, and, and this, the London Times had a headline that said, U.S. Rambo jets bomb Libya. Mm -hmm. So this was, the character became very politicized yeah. uh, in ways that are ironic, given that the novel is essentially a book about the cost that war has on its veterans. Mm -hmm. uh, so it all it got very complicated. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, a lot of times I, I, I find in, in the media and such, Rambo gets a bad rap. And, you know, it's, I, I think people should just look more, in, more into the character. Well, uh, speaking of which, um, the movies are inconsistent in the character, as they are from the novel. The novel's character is someone who's furious at what happened to him in the war, and what he learned about himself as a person who was good at killing. The movie took his anger and transposed it into a meekness that made him a victim. Mm -hmm. That's First Blood. The second movie, Rambo First Blood Part 2 and Rambo 3, 
reversed it and made him uh, the word, it's basically the word is jingoistic, in which he is basically a poster child for aggressive military action. Okay. Uh, and this was not the character of the, fir of the book or the, the first movie. So the, the character existed in that strange state in those two. And then in the fourth movie, Sylvester called me before it was released to tell me what his intentions were. And he said that he, in retrospect, wasn't happy with the second and the third films because they glamorized the violence of war. And that he liked the first movie a lot, but that he thought the first movie hadn't really done justice to the character in the book. And then in the fourth movie, he was going back, not to the plot, but to the character, mm -hmm. as I described him in the novel. Uh, and that, and in, the, in the fourth movie, Rambo can't get clean. Mm -hmm. He stands forever in the rain. He's washing himself all the time. It's like, you know, like blood on his hand. And there's a scene, it was never commented on by uh, reviewers. I never heard anybody speak about it. It's the most astonishing speech in the fourth movie, where he's he's determined not to go back to combat because he knows what it brings out in him. Mm -hmm. And finally, to rescue the missionaries, he's going to do it one more time. And he's in the forge making this, the knife, and we hear him thinking. Mm -hmm. And what he says is, admit it, you didn't kill for your country, you killed for yourself, and for that God will not forgive you. So that in theory he's going to save the missionaries as a way of redeeming his soul. Mm -hmm. uh, no one ever talked about that. Uh, and I, I thought it was absolutely mind-blowing that that line would be in a Rambo movie because that's more or less the novel. Yeah, because when you look at the novel, you know, through, I would say most of the novel, Rambo is fighting himself. He's always fighting himself. You're always in his head, he's always fighting himself. And I would think maybe that's why they called it Rambo, because in the novel, he's referred to he's as just the Rambo. Fourth movie. Yeah, right? yeah, the fourth movie. Um, he's, re like, in the novel, he's referred to as just Rambo. No, he's not called that even. And he's the kid. The no, he's no, from, the from 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 first blood, I mean. But in the oh, in yes. the in the fourth one, the movie's called Rambo. I would yeah. I would think that maybe that's why because it, in the novel, um, you know, they didn't really, I, yeah, they didn't. You didn't mention his name or anything. It was just Rambo. No, the, the character does not have a first name in the novel. That is correct. To humanize him because the producers were so afraid that he would be seen as um, being too aggressive. They, you know, John, and you know, when Johnny comes marching home, it's the only name he could have. Um, so, um, but in the fourth movie, interestingly, I, I, I doubt he's called Rambo a half dozen times. I think, oh wait, maybe call, one time, I think, I think they call him. I think what? they call him, I think it's only the, um, the, the the missionary guy who calls him Rambo when he comes okay. to ask him to help right. to help go look for the uh, missionaries I but, think that's know, the only Sylvester Sylvester is a very literary sense mm -hmm. and the boatman in literature is always a reference to the boatman on the river Styx who, who transports dead souls to Hades mm -hmm. so basically when they're calling him the boatman again and again and again they're calling him death. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff in that movie that wasn't understood or acknowledged. And, uh, I think people perhaps don't know how to watch movies. And they just get taken up in the immediacy of it without paying attention to stuff that's underneath. But uh, um, it, there, there are a lot of problems with the fourth movie. But that aspect of it was uh, very intelligent. Mm -hmm. Do you. Was there was there ever any any talk about doing a fourth novelization? No. Um, uh, Carolco, the company that owned the rights to the first three films to make them, um, I 
was on very good terms with them. Andre, uh, Mario Casar and Andy Vanya, um, I saw them every time I went to Los Angeles. And, um, we talked on the phone often, and we were in a cooperative venture. Um, Carol Cole, for complex reasons, went bankrupt. Mm -hmm. Uh, because of a picture called Cutthroat Island, which is the greatest financial flop in the history of film. And uh, they sold the rights to a company called Miramax, mm -hmm. the famous Weinstein brothers. And Miramax subsequently sold the company, or the rights to make Rambo movies to a company called Millennium New Image, or New Image Millennium, the names are, are sometimes used separately. And they did not, I phoned them one day and introduced myself and they told me they never wanted to hear from me, that uh, they, they weren't interested in talking to me. What? So I didn't have a relationship with them. Wow. And, and whether, I cannot explain mm -hmm. why this was said to me, mm -hmm. why I, I have, it has baffled me to this day that they didn't want to use my, if nothing else, my memory of the whole history of the films and the novel, but they were adamant that they did not want to talk to me. And uh, so, um, there was no opportunity to have the discussion about a novelization, but that said, the market had changed from the 1980s. And by 2007, which as I recall is when the film came out, there was no interest in novelizations. These days, people write um, novels based on characters in television series such as The Killing, but nobody writes novels based upon the movie, the original movie or the original pilot of the television series mm -hmm. because they can so easily see the movies or see the TV. All they have to do is stream them or get the DVD. Uh, in 1985, None of this was available. There weren't cable channels. There, there weren't DVDs. There wasn't streaming. And, and, and VHS tapes were very hard to come by and very expensive. So there was a, a people like the movie would buy the novelization to reimagine the movie. And by 2007, uh, that simply wasn't a factor in publishing. So even if I had a good relationship with the, with the company, with New Image Millennium, um, uh, there wouldn't have been a novelization. So, wow. you know, times change. And that's kind of a, a, a disservice also because for me, for example, reading First Blood Part 2, I, I read the first half of it when I bought it. I read the first half of that and Rambo 3 in the same day. And I was like, okay, I'm going to save the second half for when I do the review. Um, and when I'm reading First Blood Part 2 the other night, it's like, it's it's a disservice. I would say them not doing a novelization is a, dis is a disservice because you add so much to the book that it's almost like taking the movie and then throwing it up another ten notches. Well, you're, you're kind to say that. And, we, and remember, the, the, the Rambo First Blood Part Two is a hell of a lot of fun. I mean, mm -hmm. it's like a western. The, you know, the fight in the helicopter is like a fight on a stagecoach and... There are elements of Tarzan movies in it. It's just a lot of fun. Uh, it's not, you know, it's kind of stupid. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if all you have to do is look at one scene. There's this famous scene in which Rambo piloting a helicopter, and we're supposed to believe that a special forces, a member of special forces, had aviation capabilities. No doubt some of them do. Mm -hmm. Uh, or perhaps we could find one or two that can fly a helicopter. It's not easy. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, we accept that, all right, he's also a helicopter pilot. He's, he's a super soldier. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's being chased by a Soviet, uh, a huge helicopter. And uh, the helicopter, the Rambo's helicopter has been injured, has been, been uh, shot. And so Rambo comes down and settles above this stream, this river, or small river, whatever it is. And there's a gap in the canopy of the helicopter, and the evil 
pilot of the, <laughs> you gotta laugh, the evil pilot of the Soviet big, big, big helicopter stares down grinning, har, 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 and <laughs> like a smash, you know, and it's so funny. And Rambo has a whole bunch of rescued POWs in the back of the helicopter. What does Rambo do? He pulls <laughs> up a shoulder, a, a surface-to-air <laughs> missile, shoulder held, he fires it through the hole in the canopy, and he blows the hell out of the evil big, big, big Soviet helicopter. Now, what's wrong with this? <laughs> well, the, rock, the, the rocket backfire would have killed exactly, somebody, right? Exactly, the rocket backfire would <clears throat> have killed all the POWs that he just rescued. Now, I had a, a friend <laughs> who was a, an instructor at, at Fort Benning. Mm -hmm. He taught rangers, and he told me when when he saw that, and he and his his team were there in the in the movie watching this, right? And he and that they he said they literally fell out of their seats onto the aisle laughing. <laughs> it's so funny. And the whole movie is like that, right? It's like a parody of an action movie, and it's so well done. It's just amazing. There's a, a, is it in this one or the other one? You know, he has the bow, and he's got the arrows with the barbed tips on them, mm -hmm. right? <clears throat> and they are in a, 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 a carrier, whatever we want to call it, a clip device attached to the side of the bow. And now the manufacturer insists that for safety reasons, the arrows must be pointed down so that the, when you shoot the bow, you're looking past the fletches on the arrows. Mm -hmm. But that didn't photograph. So they turned the arrows upside down so that you saw the glint on the edges of the barbs on the arrows and that photograph but it essentially told people how to use the bow in an unsafe fashion mm -hmm. and the manufacturer which had committed to helping to promote the film in sporting good places had a fit and withdrew all of its commercial all because they were afraid they were going to get sued because someone got their eye poked out because they're screwing around with the with the bows and with the bow with the arrows right up next to their nose and their eyes. So the whole thing is just if you know if you know what to look for, the thing is just very funny, very enjoyable. Uh, just just to scream, I laugh at whenever I see it. Yeah, like the third one when he shoots the. He shoots the helicopter and they got that close up, but the arrow spins. Yeah. It takes yeah. off and it spins instead of going. Well, that's good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, like reading, and 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 Pulaski also, like you were saying before, evil. He's like ten times more evil in the novel. Very, yeah. very scary. Um, yeah, but I, he's not twirling mustache, scary, you know. I mean, yeah. It's, it's <laughs> he's a bad guy, but. You know, it's, I, it's been a while since I looked at it, but my recollection is that, you know, he, these are two warriors and that he's just, he's just determined to be better than Rambo. And, you know, and that brings out a lot of foul emotion when, when you start thinking that way. But, you know, like, I, I'm reading it and I'm, I, I was just like, oh my God, like, some of these scenes just really made me fall in love with everything all over again. Like, the scenes between him and Co. You know, like right, and that's not in the movie much. I developed a lot of that, and the the scene I most enjoyed doing. There were two. I mean, they're really gross scenes. One is what I call the slime pit sequence, where they're lowering Rambo into the slime pit, and you know, it's kind of gross in the movie. But I really get into it. He's got slugs up his nose and all that. I I just thought this is this is very funny. And the other one is where he's going down into the ravine and. He can't. It's at night, and he can't quite see. And uh, but he, there are objects around him, and they're kind of hollow, like gourds and stuff. Stuff, and he's not quite sure. And finally, he gets a good look in the moonlight, and he realizes they're all human skulls. Yeah. Uh, that's of course not in the in the movie. It really should have been. I mean, it's such a cool scene, and you know, if we're going to go over the top for for just having really really fun action sequences, then. You know, it, um, so I'm glad that it's in the novelization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, also, yeah, like that. 
It, it, yeah, like when he's standing in the bones in, in the bones and, and stuff like that, and he's looking down, like the crunch, you know, like Co Co hears the crunch and they kind of realize. Right. And, but but like, there's even a little joke in it, you know, using the Ronald Reagan stuff because uh, he's rescued the POWs, and in the, this is in the novelization, and he's coming back and and they're talking about you know getting home and about they've been away so long and. And somebody says, you know, who's president? And, and Rambo says Ronald Reagan. And they think he's making a joke. Because they only remember from the Vietnam era Ronald Reagan as an actor. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, so I have that little that little joke in there. And, uh, and, and it's also true to life. That would be their reaction in the 20 years that, that had elapsed. Yeah, a lot of great jokes. You know, like the, the surfboard joke. Yeah. Oh, I love that. Um, I'm well, a Philadelphia the best joke, joke. Best joke in it. It's not mine. I give. I always give credit when I can. So James Cameron had this great joke that I used, where the uh, Murdoch says to Rambo, he says, "All right, you're going to go in about 200 feet for a low altitude uh, a shoot. I, I, I've ruined the joke now. You're going to go in at 200 feet, and you're going to jump out, and you know, and can you can you manage that? And Rambo says, "Well, do I get to use a parachute?" And so I just <laughs> it's funny, you know. So uh, any, I mean, there was a lot of good stuff that I that I got to use. Well, one one joke I gotta ask about is is um, I think it's the scene after the sampan blows up and they're they're going downstream right. and they reunite. I think it's that scene. I'm not I'm not a hundred percent sure, but um. You know, Co says, you know, Rambo, how, how are you doing? Are you okay? And yeah. he says, uh, I'd rather be in Philadelphia. That's mine. <laughs> That's my joke. That's not camera. Was, was, yeah. that, a, was that a Rocky first, joke? There's an extra joke there because Sylvester comes from Philadelphia. Yeah. So, you know, there's a, there's, it, it's, a, it's a W.C. Fields joke because they said, you know, when he was dying, he said he'd rather be in Philadelphia. And so, you know, there are a couple of jokes on top of each other in that comment. So, and I tried to do that as much as I could in the, in the novelization. Mm -hmm. But you just, it, just, just going back and reading it, you fall in love with the characters all over again. Um, yeah, it, because the characters are more identified. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, it was only an 80-page, 80 85-page script. It was pretty thin. I think something that brought a tear to my eye, actually, um, was when, you know, like when Rambo's getting ready to go to get in the, in the plane and take off, and, and uh, Troutman, he's going through his Zen state, and Troutman appears in the doorway, and he's, like, helping him put the trans side on and everything like that. It's just, it, made, it, it, it pretty much made me cry just to remember how great of an actor... Richard Crenna was. Richard Crenna was not was a fine actor and a fine person as well. I knew Richard more than I don't. You know, I saw Richard more than I saw uh, Sylvester. He was a fine man, and um, he and I talked about this. Um, see, in the novelization, I wanted to incorporate the idea more than was in the movies that Rambo saw Troutman as a father figure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that Troutman was willing to uh, to uh, abide by this. So that at the end uh, in the movie it's very subtle and Richard said it was an accident. Uh, Rick, uh, Rambo jumps out of the helicopter having delivered the POWs and now he's going after Murdoch. So he's got the mini M60 and he's going into the hangar to uh, get Murdoch. But Trumpman is standing in front of him. And they stare at each other. And now Richard said it was an accident, but it's one of those happy accidents. Because if you look at the film, in, almost imperceptibly, Trumpman nods as if giving him permission. Mm -hmm. and then steps away and Rambo goes in and I played that up a lot uh, the, the, the movie is a kind of a father son thing and, and, and we have to understand from first blood the, the novel that Rambo's motivation Rambo was beaten severely frequently by his father mm -hmm. and 
that he ran to the woods to seek shelter. And when he was able to, he left his home and joined the military. In a kind of strange circumstance that to avoid the violence in his home, he was enlisting in, a, in an institution of violence. And so there's a lot of paradox here. Um, and basically, in the second, in the novelization, he has translated all the hatred he has for his father and, and translated into affection that he has for uh, the father figure that Trumpman represents. Uh, and that's why in the third movie, he's willing to go back into action because it's Trumpman who has been kidnapped. Um, so, uh, it's a complex situation that, uh, again, I tried within the confines of what the novelization had to be, uh, that I tried to explore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and the chemistry, too, with those two characters is just, in, in both the movies and the books, is just so, so, like, together. I know in, in, in the first one, it's a, a little bit detached because it's the men under Troutman who train Rambo. And well, not but in the book, but in the movie, he says that he trained Rambo yeah. personally. Yeah. Um, and we have to remember, Kirk Douglas was originally um, Troutman and left abruptly when, with what they call creative differences and, and Richard was brought in over the weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, Kirk Douglas left on a Friday, Richard was in costume on a Monday and he didn't know what he was, he didn't understand the character and that worked to his benefit because there's that kind of insolent, kind of distant quality mm -hmm. that Troutman has in the first film uh, that's, that's, that ap aptly communicates his pride in what Rambo has, has done in a civilian war, and at the same time, his understanding that he's probably going to have to kill his student. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and which is, of course, what the novel is about, um, and uh, the novel First Blood. So, um, there, there were a lot of, um, you know, interesting uh, subtexts here that make this more than your average adventure story. Mm -hmm. And also he had some, not just amazing lines in First Blood, but if you look at some of those outtakes from First Blood, like where um, him and Teasel are talking, and, and Teasel's still, you know, kind of pushing it, that, you know, um, Rambo was wrong, and he was going after Rambo that pushed it. And, and Troutman has this really amazing line where he's like, that boy's a heart attack. Yeah. You know, just stuff like that. How, you know, with the cigar, trying not to give too much away, trying not right. to know that he knows that Rambo is more than capable of, of getting right. through. Just amazing acting. Just amazing. So, uh, I'm going to have to go shortly. I, okay. I, I, I have you booked until 11 o'clock, and uh, so if you have a few more questions, we can, um, yeah. we can uh, perhaps finish. Um, my good friend Mike wanted to know if you know if they ended up filming the diner scene from First Blood. No, not that I'm aware of. Now, there was a lot of footage shot that wasn't used. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, my understanding is that the original cut, which included scenes from Vietnam and Rambo had a girlfriend in Vietnam and all kinds of things like that that didn't pertain, um, that Gradually, the cutter, the editor, found the film by removing everything that was extraneous. And so, if there, if it was photographed, I'm not aware of it. And I never heard. I spoke to Andy uh, uh, Vanya and Mark Kassar a lot, and I never heard that it had been uh, shot. So I suspect not. Okay. Um. Let's see who else here. Uh, good friend Wallace wanted to know if if you know of any of like the free share fan Rambo stories that are out there. I don't. Um, and we have to remember the character is copyrighted. 
Yeah. Uh, so that if anybody's writing for their own amusement, that's that's fine. You know, if they can share it with friends. But if these things are online, and, and you know, especially if anybody's charging money for them, uh, this is a not a good thing. Yeah. And uh, either you know, I if I knew about it, I'd have to do something else that you know the studios would. It's you know, it's a it's flattering to know that there is that people want to invent more stories, but. Um, you know, there's a certain limit to how they could be used. Yeah, true. Very, 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 very true. Um, any any thoughts on on Rambo Five? Well, um, a couple of things. Uh, there was talk for a long time. There were many ideas floating around, and I uh, didn't like most of them. Uh, there was going to be a science fiction one in which he was against some alien. Mm -hmm. um, he was going to be a horse whisperer. Uh, he was going to be, I don't know, the, the, they sounded uh, perhaps a stretch. And um, they couldn't, the, the production company knew it was money and couldn't come up with a concept that they and, and Sylvester were happy with. Mm -hmm. um, that said, we need to remember that Sylvester broke his neck filming the expendables yeah uh, and and the 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 extraordinary documentary that's on the dvd of the expendables uh shows this the, the, the literally the suffering that sylvester went through to make that film as director writer and one of the, the action stars and it shows a scene the scene in which he broke his neck mm -hmm. he landed in a flip right here and and the, the uh, physicians wanted to shut the movie down because mm -hmm. he needed an operation, he needed a plate to be fused in here. And he said that if he did, the production would never get back up to speed because of the convalescence period. And basically, he took the chance to finish the film and then have the surgery. Uh, he was also working with a broken leg, I'm sorry, a broken foot in many of the later scenes in the film. I mean, he got injured badly, and I myself had seen him injured in uh, Rambo 3 filming. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, it's my feeling that these expendable movies, uh, and this is just me, I have no idea if this is the case, but that by surrounding himself with major action figures, that he can minimize his own stunts. I mean, he can shoot and do all that, but the flying around and going through windows and all that, that he could minimize those stunts in an effort to avoid another serious injury. Mm -hmm. Now, Rambo is, you know, a loner. Uh, so, all right, you might put him with a team. Um, and in fact, uh, it might be interesting to have him working with a very young team and him he would be now 69, something like that. It uh, would be interesting to play with that. Uh, the elderly, wise uh, warrior, mm -hmm. uh, etc. Et but um, I don't hear much, but the sense I get is that this isn't going to happen. Now, never say never. Yeah. Uh, but I'm, I just have the feeling that the ending of the fourth film where he arrived back in the United States wearing the same clothes that he wore in the first scene of First Bullet, and then goes down the road to meet his father. Uh, of course, in my scenario from the novel, this was a father who had beaten him. Mm -hmm. So whatever was going to go on down there, probably, you know, would have... Uh, in the movies, this, this subplot doesn't exist. Uh, but in any case, it was a fitting end if that was going to be the end. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, have you have have you seen have you seen um, Mickey Cardoni's audition to play young Rambo from back in a uh, couple of years ago? They had um, they had listed on any cool news that Sly was maybe interested in doing another film, uh, almost like a remake with a younger with a younger person, and there was an audition. <laughs> And this is, uh, frankly, it's news to me. I get requests maybe every week to write a prequel 
um, <laughs> in which uh, you know Rambo would be young either in Vietnam or uh, as a as a young young man before the, the, the he joined the military. Um, I have resisted these, and remember, no one can write prose, you know, write fiction about Rambo other than myself. I have resisted this because the book, the book has never been out of print. First Blood has never been out of print in 42 years. It's amazing that this doesn't happen. There are very few books from that period that are still in print. It's 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 not an exaggeration to say that among thriller writers, it's revered. Mm -hmm. for, for showing a new way to write action. Um, I have an idol, his name is Jeffrey Household, who in 1939 wrote a, a book called Rogue Male, R-O-G-U-E-M-A-L-E. -E. It's about a British big game hunter who stops Hitler on the eve of the Second World War. And he's captured on the first page. And the novel is about his escape. It's a brilliant book. Um, it, it is reviewed as well, and, and in fact, I'm sometimes compared to Household, so I think about him a lot. Mm -hmm. And Household, many years afterward, wrote a sequel called Rogue Justice, which wasn't as good as the first one, mm -hmm. and which tarnished the reputation of the first one. So whenever I'm tempted to maybe write a prequel to First Blood, I think about the 42-year reputation that the novel has acquired, and why would I bother? Yeah. You know, why would I take the chance that someone would say, well, it wasn't what I expected? Because the truth is, nothing after 42 years could meet the expectations of what people think a prequel could be. So some things just aren't meant to be. And if, and if people, if people want to have some more prequel aspects, they should and they haven't read, you know, like, say, First Blood Part 2, they should, because there is a, a, a lot of what would be going on from the... Yes, from the way back, Especially with Tay, bringing Tay back into the uh, equation. The VC yes, commander. Right. Um, that, that, you know, like you said before, the well, slime pit. I'll, I'll leave you with this thought. Um, and one of the other reasons why I did the novelization for Rambo First Blood Part 2 the mission calls for him to go back to the same POW camp from which he escaped. Mm -hmm. There is no significance put upon this in the, in the movie. They just say, you're going back to the POW camp you escaped from. Ramos is all okay. What? Mm -hmm. What an opportunity to, to, to miss the psychological, him re-entering the war going back to the hell that he was in in order to redeem himself and the novelization goes on with this at length to explore this aspect of his personality and, and the emotions. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there are many, many ways in which Grandma First Blood Part Two, as good of action, as amusing an action film as it is, could have been so much better. And uh, so anyway, I'm, I'm going to have to leave you okay, with Dave. that thought. All right. Well, thank you very, 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 very much. You're very uh, welcome. And, and maybe we could do it again sometime. In print, and mm -hmm. it's been out of print for many years, unlike the novel. Mm -hmm. And the novelization should be in print, uh, perhaps in a, uh, this is uh, the middle of July, uh, uh, probably by the uh, middle of August it should be in print. Uh, so I'm looking forward to it, it, uh, seeing that, you know, once again available in addition to the e-book, of course, mm -hmm. and to make the print book a little more attractive given the e-book presence, I've added um, another e-book to it, uh, an essay of memoir I wrote called Rambo and Me, the Story Behind the Story, and that's in the print edition uh, it, uh, online. It's a separate ebook, but I've combined these two uh, again just for added value. If somebody wants the the printed book, yeah, and it's a brilliant um, essay as well. Uh, well, thank you, and so you know, it's kind of a it's a package. So, mm -hmm. all right, well, thank you for having me on, and right. uh, you know, good luck with uh, your ramble explorations. Well, thank you very much. It's been uh, more than a privilege, an honor, and oh uh, well, well, thank you. It's been an honor for me to 
to um, you know to have seen how the Rambo character has developed over the years. So it's uh, quite quite a run. So all right, I'll I'll let you go and um, and good luck to you. All right, thank you very much. Take care. Okay, goodbye. Bye. Sylvester Stallone returns to the screen as John Rambo in Rambo. Shot across three continents with a crew of 300 and a cast of three stands as one of the largest scale productions of the year. Much bigger and we're trying to make this as realistic as possible so to do this has been a difficult affair. Hello. Hello. Hi, how are you? No, I can't. I'm good. I can't see you, though, so let me figure this out. Yeah. It's been a while. What, <laughs> what do I do to see you? Um. Let's you see. see me? I can't see you. There should be a bomb. A, a bottom. A button at the bottom that says turn off or turn on video. It's right next to the little microphone icon. Alright, let me see. Yeah, there's share. Start video. Alright. Okay. Booting up. It's coming up there. Okay, so then I accept, right? Oh, yeah, there you are. Okay, very good. How's it going? It's alright, but we gotta get our um does the light look all right behind me? See if I it's can. a little, it's a little choppy. It might be just be the camera. Yeah. Well, I don't know. So, uh, and you're very dark. Oh, I'm dark. Hold on, I'll try to light it up a bit. I don't know if that will help. Uh, it helps a little bit. There we go. Yeah, you know, it's better. So anyway, yeah, I'm fine. Good, good. Yeah. It's very snowy here. There's like snow everywhere here. Yeah, we had some as well. Yeah. We, we're in the mountains. The Santa Fe is in the mountains. So mm -hmm. we, um, I'm looking out the window now. Uh, we've been getting snow a lot, and we're welcome. Uh, we, we're, we welcome it because we need it from reservoirs. Yeah. That's uh, true, eh? For the water. It says um, internet connection problem. Yeah. If I do lose you, I'll ring you back. These things happen. Okay. So what do you skip here? Is there some problem? Um, usually it happens when I Skype with people from far away. Like uh, I was... Uh, yeah. I had one guy from Brazil on and it kept on cutting in and out. Constantly, but um, it sh I guess it should be okay. It should be okay because we changed all our um, our uh, provider and everything. So from from back from then, yeah. So first blood part two. Uh, it could be my eye of century length. Century length is not great. Yeah. Yeah. So so the reissue. The reissue is fantastic. The first blood reissue. Yes. I, I just wanted to congratulate yeah, you on a, that. I, I pulled the cop on the shelf. The uh, it's a pretty thick book. Mm -hmm. It has um, the story behind it is that the uh, publisher had Gauntlet Press, mm -hmm. uh, G A U N T L E T Press, for people who don't. See how it's spelled. Um, asked me if I'd be interested in uh, collectors' reissues of the three Rambo books I did: First Blood, uh, and then the two novelizations, uh, Rambo First Blood Part Two and uh, Rambo Three. And at first, I wasn't um, very excited. Uh, that is not uh, because uh, the book existed in paperback editions. First Blood Room. It's never been on print, and I didn't see what the, yes, it would be in hardback for the first time in many, many years, and I didn't see what else, what was the value of the collectors in this. 
And then I had uh, a revelation uh, because I suddenly remembered all the files I have that I've kept for every book over the years. And I remembered uh, essays, particularly one from the 1980s that had been written for a magazine called the Penn Stater, which is the alumni magazine for uh, Penn State, where I went to graduate school where I wrote a lot of first book. And they had uh, done a lot of research to find uh, secrets, as it were, that um, I used a lot of local places in the book, but pretended it was somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so the essay is called Rambo at Penn State, and it had a, it, it just a wealth of background information. And then I thought, well, I, I have other essays that I know of like that. So I gathered them all together. And I, I went, I, I, in my searches, I, I found a box of uh, manuscripts um, over this way underneath the shelf uh, that I hadn't looked at uh, since I moved here to Santa Fe, New Mexico in 1992. And I probably hadn't looked at since I put everything in the box in 1972, when the first book was published. And so I found the first chapter of the novel, which was never published. Uh, uh, it, the book originally began in the middle of the story with the chase. And so that's uh, the insecure first novel that's that I went and I thought, well, I have to start really exciting. So I began with the chase and quickly realized that um, the uh, readers didn't know who the characters were, so why should they care? And then I had to start much earlier. But there was this very well-written uh, first chapter in which two guys in a helicopter are, are looking for Rambo and find the sea and start to shoot at him. And uh, I thought, you know, it's a shame not to use this. So the book then contains not only these very formative essays, but this first chapter that had never been published. And then I, I, we had photos of, of uh, the additions that I uh, particularly like, the covers that I thought were the best. And, and on, and on, when we were done, it was a, uh, I, and I had photographs of, that I had taken too that survived from 1968 when I started the book and was doing photographs of locations that I wanted to use, particularly the, the, the police station. Mm -hmm. uh, in the town near Penn State. So anyway, uh, it was, once I got the idea, I got really excited. Uh, I thought, this is archival. Um, you know, I'm a, I was a professor, and I'm always interested in scholarship and having uh, research items available. So I thought, all right, I'll put together, you know, what I think are some essential elements. So thank you. It, you know, it turned out really well. Yeah, yeah, um, amazing. Like, when I, when I got that in the mail, I just chopped through those those last hundred pages like all that stuff that's in there is, did is you, great. Uh, I, did, did you get the, the, the there are two editions? There's it, these are pricey books we, we yeah. grant, but the public it's a small publisher, there's no major publisher that would have released this at, at this point in the way publishing works now. Mm -hmm. So it was a small publisher and so they had to put a price on it that would allow them to make a profit, given that they were printing only 500 copies. Um, and then, then, as you know, I, I think you know, there was a further edition of, of 52 copies that were kind of deluxe, and that's the one that had the photographs in and all that. But, um, you know, the, 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 and that was more expensive, as you're aware. Which, which did you get? I got the, uh, the lettered edition in the case. The yeah. tray case and all that? Yeah. That was phenomenal. That was phenomenal. You know, if I had my, my, my brothers, I would have had only the one edition, and, you know, it would have been more expensive, but people could have had access to it. But it wasn't my decisions about how to, how to release it, but um, uh, in, in either version, it's, it's still pretty impressive. Oh, it was amazing. Uh, it, was well worth, it was well worth the price. It was like... It was like the, the, the holy grail, especially to go over that gorilla I chapter. Of, you know, and I, I, you know, I said I personally uh, selected everything. So uh, if this is part of, a, of an ongoing uh, process. So um, 
first blood, uh, I'm saying this wrong, Rambo First Blood Part 2 uh, is now uh, available for pre-order from the same place, Godly uh, Press. And once again, I thought, well, um, if um, let's see what I have in the files. So uh, there were, uh, the, the, you can't talk about Rambo First Blood Part 2 without talking about Chris. It's based upon a screenplay that I did not write. Uh, but the, the, anybody who knows the novelization is aware that it is almost not the movie. It's, mm -hmm. it's very close, but it's not the movie. Uh, the, the, I did not want uh, originally to do the novelization, and uh, the, the production company, Carolco, really wanted, this was in the 80s when, when they were very good promotional devices. Mm -hmm. And so Carol said, we really want you to do it, and I'm the only one who can write books about Rambo. So we worked out a deal where I would use the shooting script, and then I would use, um, there was an earlier script that was not used, it was written by James Cameron uh, of Terminator 2, etc., fame, Avatar fame. But in those days, he wasn't James Cameron, as we know him. Was his screenwriter. He did. He had written and directed the first Terminator movie, but he was not yet the guy who won Academy Awards and things. Mm -hmm. So the script had been written with Sylvester Stallone and a sidekick in mind. John Travolta had John Sly had directed John Travolta in a movie called Staying Alive, which is the sequel to. Um, Saturday Night of uh, Fever. Mm -hmm. And they, they worked well together and they thought, all right, we'll put, put uh, uh, the other actor, uh, Travolta, in a secondary position. And, and it, it didn't work out for whatever reason. So the script was, was not used. But, mm -hmm. but apart from that, the script had a lot of good stuff in it. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly an opening which um, Colonel Troutman gets out of a military vehicle and walks into um, a uh, hospital. Uh, and for the, and we gather after a while it's a mental hospital. Mm -hmm. And on the first first wing, people are just watching TV, and then the second, people are actually doing baskets. And he descends into the bowels of this institution where there's an armed man outside a. Uh, a, what amounts to a prison door, and um, and the, uh, the the armed man says to Troutman, he broke the light again and <laughs> he's the fucking prince of darkness. <laughs> and uh, what a line! Right? There's a and lot of great lines in that script. <laughs> it's a great line, and, <laughs> and Troutman's going to go and talk to him, but. Uh, the guard says, I better go in with you and bring the gun. And, and Trumpman says, no, it's all right. He won't harm me. Mm -hmm. And he goes in and the story starts. It's there that he's offering him the chance to go to Vietnam and to, to do the reconnaissance on the POWs there. So um, the producers told me that they felt it would be a tactical mistake to begin the film that way because it made Rambo sound crazy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the script, ex except for the plot, was discarded. But the, the, the shooting script that I received was very thin, it was 86 pages. And it had lines like, Rambo jumps up and shoots this guy, Rambo jumps up and shoots that guy. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I, I can't do anything with this. And I said, what else do you have? And they said, well, we have the James Cameron script. Oh, really? Send it to me. Mm -hmm. And I thought, there's, there's a lot in here that I can use, especially that opening. And then, so the deal we worked out with Carol Cole was that there'd be the shooting script, there'd be Cameron's script, and there'd be a lot that I would have. And uh, so the novelization broke all kinds of rules. Normally, novelizers are required by contract to stick. They can't change a line of the dialogue. And all they can do is add interiorization of what the character's thinking in a, perhaps an action scene. 
and describe a lot of stuff. Uh, and I, did, I just didn't want to do that. So they said, fine, as long as they can recognize the movie mm -hmm. in the book, good. So the, the novelization broke a lot of rules, and uh, it may be unique to this day. Uh, and then, it, it breaking more rules, it was the New York Times bestseller. Uh, and uh, it's it's, a, it's an odd thing because it's a, it's a novel, but it isn't. It's based on a screenplay. And anyhow, so, you know, that was years ago. And not that soon, let's reissue that too. And we're going to do, it'll be different because this will be the first hardback. Okay. Yeah. And then I wrote an introduction for it uh, that talks about a lot of the stuff that I just told you. Mm -hmm. And then I have an essay called Rambo and Me, the story behind the story that's uh, available online for 99 cents, but it's not in print. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I thought, we'll add that. And then there was a, an essay when the film came out, 1985, the Los Angeles Times did a huge, huge piece about uh, the movie and the book called The Curious Evolution of John Rambo. Oh. In which they talked. Uh, there were 26 scripts. There were five wow. studios. Uh, people like Paul Newman. Paul Newman was at one time being approached to play Police Chief mm -hmm. with Martin Rick direct. Steve McQueen at one time was going to be Rambo with um, uh, Sidney Pollock directing. And the, for various reasons, these films didn't reach the screen. Uh, and the reporter for the LA Times, which is a show business town, did this massive, massive essay talking about all of the iterations for this curious evolution thing. Mm -hmm. And so um, I told Got the Press about it, and Got the Press paid the LA Times a fee to reprint it. And there'll be a lot of stuff like that in there. Uh, that, so it's going to be as packed as the um, the first blood um, collector's edition was, with and with the bonus, and you you became impressed by that, that it's going to be for the first time a hard one, and it'll they'll be signed and they'll be numbered, and you know it'll be acid free paper, and all the stuff that collectors expect. So I'm pretty you know pretty excited about uh, doing this, and then. This is the 2016 and 2017. Um, there will be a similar edition for Rambo 3. And that will have unpublished stuff in it. I found a chapter that wasn't used in the book. Oh, excellent. And uh, so, uh, and there will be another essay, uh, this time from Entertainment Weekly, uh, oh, nice. about what happened to Carol uh, Pictures and why they don't exist anymore. Things like that. So I'm, I'm pretty, you know, the whole thing is, is you know, a, a really exciting project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got letter O. My first blood is, is letter O. So I guess that's like the fifteenth, the fifteenth print or something like that. I'm sorry. The the print I got is is a uh, is letter O. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think yeah, the, it's like the, the, the letters that were 25 letter, 26 letter uh, upper case alphabet, and then 26 lower case alphabet for a total of 52. Um, and again, you know, it's for the collector's, collector's market. It's fascinating. Like that gorilla. The gorilla is just, wow. Yeah, that's the, the untitled, the, the unused first uh, chapter. But to have that like... I, I, I wanted to ask you like the the um, the greaser aspect the the greaser aspect look of Rambo in that um how did how did you come up with how did you because like later on in in the in the published version of First Blood you see uh, he's in um, more of a military garb but how did you yeah. how did you come up with the um, the greaser look that you kind of get from the gorilla chapter. Well, the, 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 the gorilla, of course, is uh, that was the original title as the Soldier's Run was another title, and um, I had several uh, until we settled on First Blood. The, um, it, it, it shows how much my thinking had evolved in the, in the chapter that was never used. Uh, Rambo is, in fact, a leather jacket. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. uh, and that's obviously wrong. Uh, but I left it in just you know so people could see how how these things uh, change and, and and hopefully get better. Um, and you know, but the the, the uh, discovery for me came when I was telling the story that uh, I couldn't be I couldn't start it in the middle. Of the if we don't know who these people are, we're not going to care. So yeah. I had to start, I finally decided, with the scene in which the police officer and Rambo finally initially meet. And that was when he was hitchhiking into town. And um, boy, um, I, I rewrote that novel a lot. And once I settled on that scene as the one that began the book, then I was in good shape. Amazing, amazing. So I was on it. Like when I, when I first uh, when the when the book came in the mail and I was I was reading that chapter I just I was like oh I wanted to go on forever <laughs> it was like well, the it tension I promise you because it becomes a whole lot of running around yeah it's like uh, a, a it's, total it, alternate it, it, you know when you're saying well, wait a minute who's this guy uh, you know uh, 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 who are these people it was confusing. Yeah. As, as exciting as it was, it was confusing. And eventually, I was forced to use the flash, as I explained in the in the notes from the chapter. Eventually, I, after 30 pages, I finally had to flashback to show how all of this started with Rambo coming into town and why the police officer mm-hmm. thought he was going to be a problem. Uh, and and, and it, you know, like, at a certain point, I said, you know, why don't I just start there mm-hmm. and get rid of all this stuff and put it over here and just take that where he walks into town and that's the beginning and uh, a lot of the structural problems I was having um, um, that's all mm-hmm. I, know, I know I wanted to ask you last time you were on um, but we had some fan questions so I, I didn't I didn't really get to ask you but there's this section in, in First Blood um, kind of like you know when when Teasel's having kind of the premonition, or not, I won't say premonition, but kind of like the vision of Rambo in the junkyard and all that. Was yes. was that kind of a nod to, I don't want to say astral projection, but kind of like like in the old stories of, of knights or whatever, when they would go on quest, they would have these heightened kind of... Um, kind of like heightened sense, kind of like something guiding them. Because like the two almost yes. become one at a yeah, point. The idea. It, it, it has a lot to do with the uh, idea of Hunter and Hunted. Mm-hmm. Um, but before I talk about that, there's a, there was a book I used for research called The Hero with a Thousand Faces mm-hmm. uh, by Joseph Camp. Uh, this same book, many years later, was used by George Lucas to help him understand what he was doing in the Star Wars saga. And uh, in, in the Hero with a Thousand Faces, the hero's journey, there's a moment, there's a mystical moment that uh, Campbell talks about where the life and death issues of the, have, have caused uh, almost a, a, a preternatural way um, for someone to to see the world, that everything is so clear. I, I suppose the only way I could compare it is if anybody's ever played sports and there's been a moment when if you're a baseball player and that ball comes and you just know you're going to hit it and you're going to hit it so hard and it's going to go so far and in that moment when you hit it, it's like the whole universe explodes. Mm-hmm. Or if you're a football player and you know that impossible catch that you knew you were going to make because everything was so clear and so in such slow motion. Uh, where basketball players, you know, you hear about basketball players from the end, throwing the court, throwing the ball, and knowing before they threw it that the ball was going to go in at the far end, way, way, way mm-hmm. um, down the court. And uh, in, uh, when you think about the traditional hundred thousand stories, about uh, the two becoming one. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's difficult to talk about, but you see it a lot in 
in the stories, if you look at, say, William Faulkner's The Bear, uh, which is a hunting story, um, he, he gets into that too. What happens when you're in the forest, the primordial surroundings, and there's this life and death uh, circumstance where everything becomes so heightened, it's almost like you could soak off the crowd. Mm-hmm. And so I was trying to keep that. And in, uh, uh, in the novel, uh, Rambo is in a uh, bat cave at one point. In the movies, they made it rats, but in the novel, it's bat. And it's horrific. It's just, it's just horrid. Mm-hmm. And he manages to get through that experience, and it almost as if it's a mystical experience of me going through the, mm-hmm. the, the bat. And he comes out on the other side, seeing the world in in a in a clarity and a, and a purity that uh, he's never experienced before. And meanwhile, the police chief has nearly died um, because of him him having escaped through a slope of thorns, mm-hmm. uh, brambles, almost been flayed alive, but he's still he's still there, but he's bled a lot. And, He's in very bad shape, and he's having a similar mental, emotional experience um, because of his pain um, and and what pain can do to a person in terms of perception. So they're both seeing in a way that they're extraordinarily clear and extraordinarily tightened, and it's as if they can in their imaginations know what the other person is doing. Mm-hmm. And this is not uncommon in combat. Uh, if you talk to some people um, within a in really extreme combat situations, often they, they, they feel as if they knew what they going to do with what you want to do. Mm-hmm. So in that kind of motion is what I was trying to communicate. And uh, the point, in fact, as you know from having read First Blood, Randall wouldn't believe he's God. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, um, you know, it was very mystical and hyper yeah. uh, in keeping with what Randall and Buddhism. Mm-hmm. It sounds like someone's hammering in the background. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. That's uh, speaker pump. I don't know. It might be. Kind of bursting through the floor. <laughs> it's kind of like chopping up. A bit. All right. Can you? Th- all right. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause I was always wondering that. You know, like going back before reading that, and wow, it was like reading that when I was younger too. I was like, wow, that's that's something I always wondered about between them. You know, there's there's something else we're talking about, which is I was raised in Canada. And uh, I came to the United States when I was in my early 20s to go to graduate school at Penn State. And that was in 1966, and I had no idea what Vietnam was. Um, And I found out. Um, And I was required to sign a loyalty oath by the, um, so as you the tenor of the times, uh, Penn State, I had to sign a loyalty oath. And I was told that as a guest, from another country, I should, I didn't uh, have a right to political opinion, and I shouldn't talk about politics, which is, wow. I guess, a reasonable um, requirement. Mm-hmm. But as a consequence, as the Vietnam War heightened and as the country polarized, you know, there were hundreds and hundreds of riots uh, in 1968, particularly, and then the, the campuses, college campuses began having demonstrations that often became worse than that if we look at, say, um, what happened at Kent State in 1970, where the Ohio National Guard shot to death protesters, unarmed protesters. That's and that continues for me to be one of the most shameful moments in United States history. I can say that because I'm now a citizen. Um, but I didn't mention any politics in, in the first book. And I, if I mentioned Vietnam at all, it might have been two or three times. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's been a while since I've looked at the book. But Vietnam was not, um, it was sort of taken for granted. Mm-hmm. And readers in 1972 knew what I was writing about. 
and the polarity of the country. And, and particularly, I was very pleased that the police officer, and this is not in the movie, I like the movie, but there, you know, there's always changes in the movie, did not emphasize that the, the police chief um, had been in Korea, that he had been at the Chosen Reservoir Retreat, which is mm -hmm. the biggest event uh, uh, for many military people in, in the Korean War. So the, the police chief thought he understood how many I understood military and wars, that was a conventional war. Mm -hmm. And now he's up a guerrilla war, which is so far different. Mm -hmm. um, so that you know, the, the, the contrasts that I was playing with were quite um, quite exciting and stimulating, and, and you know, people reading the novel are always surprised by the police chief's background and what we learn about it, which we don't. Um, for time and time reasons mm -hmm. in, in the film. Uh, it's a, in other words, there's a lot more in the book. And similarly, talking about the novelization, uh, Rambo First One Part Two, there's a ton more, mm -hmm. two thirds more uh, in the book than there was in the film. Yeah, some of those scenes in, in the novelization for First Blood Part Two are just fantastic. Even when you get to like the third film, uh, the third novelization is just breathtaking, especially like the whole, the whole second half or the, actually both acts are very, very different, but the whole second half of that film is, it brings you back to the chase aspect of First Blood, you know, it brings you back yeah. to the, to the, you know, like, are we going to make it or the, there's that fine line of it's so easy not to make it at this point because of everything that's going wrong. And how everyone's right. kind of split up. And, oh, yes. It's amazing. Uh, yeah, you're talking about Rambo 3. Yeah. Uh, um, the, the scripts on that, we're, we're ahead of ourselves now, and as I said, the, the, hard, the collector's hardback will, will come out next year for Rambo 3. But uh, and I tell the story there that um, I was getting scripts every week. Yeah. And the scripts were vastly different from week to week. Mm -hmm. and finally, I told the producers, I said, oh, we have to stop this because I will not be able to write the book. And so I just picked one script and then again did what I did for Rambo First Blood Part Two. I, I made it a novel instead of Rambo Shoots This Guy and Rambo Shoots That Guy. And the thing that I wanted to do We'll back up. In, in Rambo First Blood Part 2, that is, the, that is the POW camp that he escaped from. But in the movie, they nearly make a side reference to it. Yeah. And he could have been going anywhere. Yeah. But in the novelization, I said, wait a minute. He's got to be feeling something. He's, got, he's going back where his personal hell occurred. Mm -hmm. What's he going to do about it? And so that's some of the extras that I put in, the whole aspect that this is the camp he was held prisoner in and tortured in. And in the Rambo 3, um, by, by, it was so obvious that, that, that Afghanistan was Russia's Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And that Afghanistan had affected Russia's culture and and weakened the country in the way that Vietnam weakened the United States. Mm -hmm. And so, in the third novelization, what I wanted to do was explore that there'd be a Russian who was Rambo's counterpart, who was experiencing in Afghanistan what Rambo had experienced in Vietnam, mm -hmm. and that these two would be pitted against one another in a way that I thought was really, really epical and exciting, and is, of course, not in, in the movie. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was really exciting to write about, and, and the book was about something. Uh, and, and it's so odd now, of course, because rather than learn from Russia's experience, we have become admired in Afghanistan in the same way. Yeah. It's Afghanistan a pit. A kit for people for for uh, for nations uh, to to 
Mm-hmm. Then, I just the other big thing I wanted to ask about was your original screenplay for Rambo Three. I know you talk about it a little bit in the uh, in the right. novelization. Um, can you give us any more of what happened of well, like sure. the story? Uh, it's not. It's not. Uh, it was set in so I, I and this is in I think in Rambo in the in the when Rambo Three comes out there'll be material about this in there. But I don't mind talking about it. Thank you. Um, I the the concept was that uh, Rambo would it was set in South America, and you have to realize in those days in the 1980s uh, the, the the Central and South America was a hotbed of American involvement to do with dictatorships and revolutionaries. And there was a very famous, nobody thinks about it anymore, in which uh, the then uh, admit, uh, uh, American the, the, the president, Ronald Reagan, uh, and his presidency had, had provided arms to a rebellious group in, I believe it was Central America, by going the long run through the Middle East, as I recall it was through Israel. So we paid Israel to supply arms to rebels in Central America so that it, there wouldn't be any record of it in the congressional hearings. And it was a major scandal when it was uncovered and there were all kinds of hearings about it and nobody thinks about it anymore. But at the time it was, it was pretty dramatic. And anyhow, lots of stuff was going on down there. And uh, it, uh, the idea was that Troutman, Colonel Troutman, would have been a military advisor mm -hmm. to one of these groups, and that he would have been captured by the opposition, and that um, a long, basically, that an embassy would have been taken over, and. Um, Rambo in the United States, um, there's always the question of what he's going to be and mm -hmm. uh, whether it was the right choice or not. He was um, um, he was working on tall buildings. He was the guy who worked at the very tallest part of the tallest building under construction, and that you know that he would that he, he, it was very very mystical to see him up there and that he had no fear of heights. Uh, and but he would he found out about what had happened and immediately set out and um, I it, it would be tedious to go through the entire plot but the the idea was that it was another rescue story uh, with Rambo that's not exactly an original thing but it's what the production company wanted and uh, for me the most interesting thing is that Rambo would have been helped by Troutman's wife. Mm -hmm. Who was who was a military wife and do as much about weapons as anybody else mm -hmm. in in the, and and that the two of them would have set out to save him and it was there was a big discussion in in, in with the production company that there was no way they were going to allow this to happen that it had to be rambled by himself and that nobody would believe. That a woman would be able to handle weapons that way, et cetera, et cetera. How you, far would you come? You could imagine like a Sigourney yeah. Weaver kind of. Yeah. Well, that's you know, the like, thing. And, and what's so interesting, what's so interesting is that not many years later, Sigourney Weaver, in fact, became the prototype for the woman warrior mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Aliens, and not the first one, but the second mm -hmm. one. Uh, so you know, I I always thought of it as a lost opportunity. Um, that's, you know, stuff happens. They decided that Afghanistan was hotter than Central America in terms of politics and getting attention, so they they did Rambo of Arabia and, and, and instead. If you ever if you ever find pages from that, let me oh, know, I, please. I have <laughs> pages of, there are there are problems. It, 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 it's so much of its time, mm -hmm. you know, that and, and anyway, I, you know, when you do that, when you do, when you write a script, even if it's from a character that I created, it's work for hire. 
So that's the term, and, and the company, they're no longer in business, but regardless, Terrible Picture owns that script yeah. and the rights to, to it. So I could never, like, print it. I could yeah. never self put it in a book because it isn't, it isn't mine. It's, mm-hmm. it's a peculiarity of the way Hollywood works. But, man, it sounds fascinating, just that angle. Just that whole angle sounds fascinating. Well, I was yeah, talking to someone yeah. on uh, the guys on Slycast who are big, big, uh, big fans uh, of the Rambo franchise. Well, everything Sly, but they did all these amazing um, Rambo reviews. So I was talking with them about that, and they were fascinated. They were like, "Wow!" If they were trying to get their heads around what that could have looked like, what that could have been like. Yeah. That whole. But Amazing like, stuff. Uh, I, you know, there were just as there were twenty six scripts for first blood uh, at different scripts. Um, so you know, uh, for all I know, there were a lot of other scripts that were written that I wasn't told about for Rambo two and Rambo three. So Hollywood is um, they the, the producers don't like anybody else to know what's going on. So there's a lot of secretiveness and compartmentalization. Mm-hmm. But I, it was pretty exciting. I spent two days with the Carol Cole people. I knew uh, Mario Passar and Andrew Vigno. Uh, I knew Andy better than I knew Mario. But we spent time together, and, and I, you know, I was often in their offices. Uh, and I, I really liked the guys. And it was a very exciting time. But um, there, you know, there were um, that uh, that was a critical moment. I, I don't care for um, the third movie, as it turned out, uh, because. It has, it's repetitive. Rambo, uh, Troutman is kidnapped, captured, fine. Rambo tries to rescue him and fails. Rambo tries to rescue him and succeeds. Mm-hmm. And in my definition, if you look at it, it's repetitive. Mm-hmm. And that's why when I did the novelization, I invented a new third act for the story. Um, that would, you know, have a more epic feel to it. Yeah, we were, we were t- actually talking about that the other day. I had my niece's boyfriend was over here. We were actually watching, uh, I had um, a gentleman from the UK, Mr. Mike Chapman, sent me a fan edit of, of Rambo 3 that had all the deleted scenes in it and stuff. So we were sitting down watching that. And... Uh, we were actually going over that, that it was kind of like a wasted opportunity that um, it was, it's like Rambo fails, Rambo succeeds, when they could have added a lot more in. Yeah. Like, I was telling them about, you know, like the scene when Rambo's coming into the camp with um, with Musa, and Musa says, um, this is the only doctor for 500 miles, and you only see that character for two seconds, and I was telling him that it was yeah. so wasted that they took the char- character of Michelle out. You know, from Ram- from the novelization of Rambo three, um, I think her name was Michelle, the nurse, the friend. Um, yeah, yeah. The nurse is huge, in the, and she's a French doctor, and she's huge in the novelization, and she's virtually non-existent in the film. But in the first draft of the script, she had a marvelous part. Mm-hmm. And what I was seeing, and I, uh, what I, in a way this happened with Rambo First Blood Part Two, what I was seeing was these really, really interesting scripts that got chopped down with each draft. Mm-hmm. And stuff got thrown away that was really interesting. And I never knew why. But yeah. I had the material to work with so that people could have seen the movie the movies they could have made. Yeah. And I'm not complaining. I like, I like First Blood. Uh, 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 it's different, but I'm very impressed. The second movie I'm impressed with for different reasons is pure action as, a, as almost a Saturday afternoon uh, serial, uh, you yeah. know, that, of the, along the lines of, of Indiana Jones. The third one is, like any, any standard, is not a good film because of the repetition that, that I talked about. But... Um, you know, stuff happens. Yeah. It's a shame, too, because it, it was shot so p- beautifully. Like, the camera, like, the oh lens. Oh, my God. They, 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 they were trying to make Rambo over Reagan. They were, yeah. 
the, the, the budget on that was huge for the time, and, and there were scenes where stuff was going on here, and there were horsemen on a middle range back here, and then there were more horsemen or camels or something far away. I mean, they had figures miles in the distance that they were shooting. Uh, it was big. Yeah. Um, but a lot of it, you know, never yeah. showed up on the screen. Like it brings you back to those 70 millimeter, like the 70 millimeter well, filmmaking. They didn't shoot that in 70 millimeter, but, you know, it felt like it. And, you know, which brings us, you know, what's going on currently with Quentin Tarantino and The Hateful Eight. Uh, I, well, as soon as I knew that he shot that on 70 millimeter and was projecting it, Mm -hmm. uh, well, 65 millimeter, really, but it, it becomes 70. And then he's projecting it on 70 as a roadshow film with with um, with an overture and intermission in the booklet. And the film even begins. I I got my tickets right away. I mean, it doesn't matter. I like Tarantino's work. Some people don't. Didn't matter in this case because this was a film event that hadn't occurred in 50 years. Oh yeah, uh, of 70 mil shown in ultra Panavision and. I just had to laugh when, in a pleasant way, the, the film, the actual film, started with the leader for the film, so, which we've never seen in years and years and years, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, and then the movie started, yeah. which is the way film just to be way, way back, and I just I just had to laugh. So, you know, this whole issue of 70 millimeter and the, the bigness and the clarity mm -hmm. that you can get from it, and while, while Rambo 3 wasn't shot, in, in 70, it, 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 you know, the, the, the early versions look really good. It's a good looking film. Oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't look at that Tarantino movie. Like, I, I saw that on my birthday, and that was, that was just out of sight. Like, like the overture in the beginning, and even like the intermission, it was yeah. like nice to just get up and walk around, think about it, and come back. And yes. It was a great experience. And then the new right the narrator says 15 minutes ago this yeah. <laughs> 15 minute interrupt and so I'm curious about the digital version whether it's going to have the, the voiceover saying 15 minutes ago and filling us in again or whether he re if that's the spot that he re-edited in, 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 and, and that it'll just, we'll just I don't want to give away the plot but you know that it'll be it'll be edited differently in order to eliminate the intermission. I don't know. But anyway, it was cool. And, you know, what, what that experience has taught me, I've had a lot of conversations with people. And people say, well, I don't like Tarantino. Who cares? It's, that's irrelevant mm -hmm. to what this was in terms of an event. Uh, and what I realized is that there, it's like people have said, you know, I didn't like the new Mad Max. And I said, well, why not? It's a, it's a gorgeous movie. And they say, oh, well, it might have had something to do with the fact that I saw it on a TV screen uh -huh. on an airplane when I was flying. And I yeah. said, surely you realize you didn't see the film. And, and you know, some, are, some movies are movie movies. Yeah. They must be seen big. They were designed for that and fail even on so-called big screen film. Uh, and this thing, you know, what I saw with the current screen for April 8, oh, my God. And, uh, but anyway, what it taught me is that there are people who like story more than they like movies. Yeah. More than they like films. And then I was at a dinner party the other night, I had a conversation with somebody who thought that uh, Citizen Kane was one of the worst movies ever made. And I, I was just stunned uh, by this thought. Uh, it, he, he felt it was boring, although at the time it would not have been boring, because mm -hmm. Hearst was... The, the, the newspaper mogul Hearst was a hugely controversial figure and the movie was so condemnatory on him that, you know, some theaters wouldn't even show it. So it was a very hot thing. But granting for the passage of time, how can anybody be bored by a movie that rewrites movie vocabulary in terms of how things can be filmed? And, uh, you know, I just... I've, got, I've grown to be disappointed uh, in people that I thought were sophisticated um, about, um, you know, what movies could be, but are actually just looking to be entertained. And that was, you know, for me, that's, that's not a It's true. Because we've wandered farther afield from Rambo. Like, uh, I've talked to people who, who, like, when I, for example, Mad Max, who were like, 
or it has no story, but there's a lot going on there that people just don't read what, between the lines, you know? Oh, um, no, in, in, um, in Mad Max. But oh, I, I yeah, thought... Yeah. Oh, sure, it's just not a dialogue movie. And when you see that on the big screen with the... Yeah. Movie acting is And, uh, and talking is And Tom Hardy, who looks an awful lot like Stephen Queen, uh, his, his hair is made up to look like Steve, and he's shot in profile to look like Steve. Hardy's an amazing actor. He changes his face like every movie. But I'm thinking he's Hardy, Tom Hardy, doing Stephen Queen. And the Queen was the expert in communicating not verbally mm-hmm. with eyes and gestures. And, and same with Charlie Stern. Um, it, it, uh, it, uh, that's who the, the, the female lead is, right? Charlie Stern in yeah. uh, Mad Max? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Um, the uh, I mean these these people brought movie acting to a height, mm-hmm. uh, but it's only evident on the big screen where the discipline of, of just a one link or the discipline of move, simply moving a, a muscle on the cheek can communicate pages of dialogue. And again, you know, I, you know, movies are the art form of the 20th and 21st century. And after a while, I've concluded. I don't think a lot of people know how to watch a movie. I was I was uh, talking to a film student the other day. I mean, this, somebody felt that you know was pretty expert, and uh, we were talking about the Grand Budapest Hotel, and um, and I and and I said you know what really excited me about that film was that Wes Anderson uses three different aspect ratios. Okay. In, in, the, in the story to identify different periods of time. That's amazing. Um, and, uh, and the film student looked at me like I was speaking gibberish <laughs> and, uh, and they had no idea that the, the, the aspect ratio changed all the time mm-hmm. in the film. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, if film students can't spot what directors are doing to make their work different, you know, so anyway, it's been a discouraging holiday for me to talk to people about movies and and realize that they're not watching movies; they're just watching stories that happen to move. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I agree. I, I find that a lot of people these days are just quick to point out flaws of the movie. Uh, you know, just different things yeah. like that. They don't they don't really take the time to try and get invested into the characters or what's trying to be brought forth. So... Well, you know, we'll do our best to, to, to keep people informed. But anyhow, I, I see that I'm, I'm going to have to go. I, no problem. I Thank a, you very much. Thing I have to do. All right. And uh, was anything else you, you were interested in? Um, at this point... Well, we covered oh. quite a lot. Yeah, we did. We did. <laughs> Um, so um anyway, that's about it for now, I guess. It's Gauntlet Press, G A U N T L E T Press, gauntletpress.com, and uh, they, there are a few copies of the collector's edition of First Blood still available, and and then the Rambo First Blood Part 2 has just become available for pre order. Probably for a, a June release. June release? Uh, so, and then next year's Rambo 3. Okay. I already pre ordered mine the other day. Like, as soon as, like, because I was okay. like, when is that going to drop? So, I, I remember I dropped you that that line to ask you when it was yeah. coming out. And then, as soon as I saw it up there, I went and I pre ordered it right away just in case the 52 were gone. Oh, well, you never know. You know? No. You know, they can go. <laughs> yeah, so I can't wait so to. Anyway, happy new year. Thank you. Happy New Year to you. Happy holiday season. No, it's it's at the end of the holidays yeah. now, but yeah, and I can't wait to uh, get that in the mail. It's gonna be fantastic. Yeah, well, I think they had a, a slight shipping problem because they couldn't get the cases for the for the more expensive edition. Uh, but I think they're on top of it now. Okay. And uh, I I think June will see it all going out. To well, it was well worth the wait. It was well worth the wait last time, so it's all good. I can't wait to uh, to dive okay. back into that again. Thank well, you very much for coming back on.
You're, you're quite welcome, and all my best to you. All right. Same here. Thank you. Take care. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Yeah. The story of John Rambo began six years ago with First Blood. Stallone starred as the Vietnam veteran who turned to his mentor, Colonel Troutman, when he had trouble with a world that wouldn't accept him. They drew First Blood, not me. Let me come in and get you the hell out of there. They drew First Blood. 